Um, the main thing was that um, I, I used the wrong uh, feedback in the video. I was taking this problem from the textbook that was working in those awful British units of pounds and gallons and stuff like that. So I think I messed up my conversion a bit. So the main thing that I wanted to get at was that uh, if you were using a lab test to get your setting rates in, a, in, a, in units of distance of the time, once you have that, you scale up uh, your, your unit by multiplying that settling rate, um, or dividing it rather, by the, by the adjustment factor. So we're using an, uh, an over-designed factor of two. In other words, we want to slow down our settling rate. We want to get the worst case scenario of, of the settling. So 42 millimeters per minute, we then use half of that rate down here in the denominator. The area is equal to the volumetric flow rate divided by that velocity. And you can get a, a number that's in the order of 100 or 98 meters squared. We add 7 meters squared extra for that uh, dissipation area from the settling. I'll, I'll show you what, what I mean by that in a minute. And then you can also help the, calculate the, um, the volume rate. So what I mean by that, uh, by that, uh, by that settling area is when we look at the design of these units, we go back to the slide. At the top where we, we have our feed, we have the circular region in the middle of the feed well. And that takes up some of the settling area. So in this uh, unit, we've estimated that settling area to be about, uh, sorry, that, that unit to be 70 meters squared, not going to be required. So we then need an additional area in the tank to remove some of that from the circle. Okay, so uh, where we then we, we ended off the last class talking about flocculation and, and we had that video there from MIT which was uh, quite informative and, and had a nice demonstration of what flocculation is, how rapidly we can get these solids to settle out once we form agglomerate particles. So we form particles that are larger in diameter than they would normally otherwise be and that encourages the settling uh, to, to proceed faster. As a result of that, we, we really have no idea from a theoretical perspective up front what our particle sizes are actually going to be. Um, so we really have to resort to laboratory tests. And the key, key here is, as, as normal with any um, experimental work, is that your laboratory tests are matched as close to your actual feed you plan to, to use in the future. So in many companies that are designing something from scratch, that's almost next to impossible to determine. Right, so if you're treating a chemical waste from a, from a company, a mine, or uh, some other food processing industry, you really have very little idea of, of what that, what that uh, incoming material might be. But the key is for the laboratory test is to get it as close as you can, can possibly get it, and then we apply that over design factor as well. So from the laboratory test, we're determining this rate of settling at the top over here, and once we, we have that rate of settling, we're, we're using how fast that clear area moves down, and we use that unit as our, as our average setting rate to design, to design the unit's area. So we look at flocculation, and then just in terms of, of where flocculation occurs, flocculation can either happen ahead of the unit, so you have your raw material coming into the sedimentation tank, you can have a separate temperature for the flocculant, where the flocculant is contacted with the, with the material. But most commonly, we include the flocculation inside that sedimentation vessel. So here's my sedimentation vessel, and then inside there I have an area which I have good mixing, which is kind of unusual. You, you don't normally want high agitation inside the sedimentation vessel. But this is a sweet off area. Um, so inside this circle over here, we've got agitation where we're contacting the effluent with our flocculant mixing it rapidly for about 30 seconds to 2 minutes residence time. And then you allow that, that contact material to dissipate then into the rest of the sedimentation tank. Obviously you want that, once you form those flocks, you really don't want to disrupt them again. So if the flocks, once they start to form, they're actually quite easy to break apart again if you apply excess energy. So you, 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 there's a lot of careful design regarding this feed well. 
firstly, to minimize disruption to the rest of the vessel, and, and secondly, to minimize the disrupting your clock that you just create. But then you also still want that good contract of the popular, which is can add to an expensive room, uh, chemical that you have to keep adding to this unit, your mass separating agent, if you want to see it that way. And then um, you want that good contact, but you don't want to disrupt the flux as well. So there's a lot of patterns and interesting designs regarding that heat level. Okay, now one other thing that's interesting to point out about these uh, sludge experiments is that if you do it in the laboratory in one cylinder and then you go use another cylinder of a different height, you're going to get the same set of rate, which it might seem counterintuitive, but you can show on, on any lab experiments, if I'm using it here, I, I've started with the setting height of 800 millimeters versus uh, 1.2 meters. Though that ratio from the origin to the, to the setting curve, 0 A dash and 0 A double dash, is constant everywhere, which would indicate then no matter what lab cylinder you use for this, it's, it's going to be consistent with a big cylinder or a small cylinder at all short, you're going to always get the same answer. So that's that's a, a good a good thing to have. <coughs> that our lab work is not going to be dependent on the equipment we use. The other the main point obviously is that we have a constant rate of settling there. There's a very short period of time where there may not be that constant rate. So it's usually a realistic with that small induction period up in front. But that's that's very, very minor in um, and to the rest of the curve. After that, it's constant settling. And then we reach some critical point. That critical point is where our solids at the bottom here, the critical point is defined by the point where those solids then slowly start to compress. Actually, that experiment that I had in, in the class on Tuesday, I was using concrete mixed with water. I left it in my, uh, I had it, I was trying it at home a few weeks ago. And I left it for two days, and that concrete at the salt at the bottom had pretty much solidified. And so eventually, what will happen is in that sedimentation zone, if you leave it long enough, those solids will really compress very tightly and squeeze all the water out. Um, that, so, so you don't want to actually get to that point um, when you're operating an actual sedimentation vessel. You really don't want to be in this region of operation. You want to be somewhere along that curve where you, you've got your solid settled, but they're not compressing. So the key design parameter that you start to see with these set units is what your throughput through the system is. You want to keep the flow in and flow out constant so that you don't get this over sedimentation. Conversely, you don't want your flow in too fast either to, um, to not really get the, that sedimentation level dropping to the point where you need it. So it's a very careful balance in running these wastewater treatment systems. Um, which is one reason, did any of you read that 100 Spectator article I posted on the course website about the sewer treatment in, in Hamilton? Um, if, you, if you go read that article, you'll, you'll learn quite disturbingly that Hamilton dumps all its sewage into the, into the lake during heavy rainstorms. And that's just because they cannot take all that wastewater into their treatment plant. Probably for this very reason, it will just disrupt all the, you can't accept all that volume of liquid during a rainstorm or when the snow is melting into your wastewater treatment system because you're just going to flush your entire wastewater plant out. Okay, that, that huge step up in, in, in rainwater, they pretty much just dump into the lake. Okay? But they're minimizing that over the past 20, 30 years they've built. Um, if you look at the intersection of King and Main, Dundurn, there's that piece of grass there by the church, a big cricket pitch that sometimes people use. Underneath that is actually just a big monster container. Under the ground there is a huge container, and they use that as swing space to capture rainwater. They hold it there temporarily, and then a day or two later, then they start to treat it through the wastewater treatment plant. So the, the city is, is really working on minimizing that disrupt of putting raw sewage into the lake. But one of the main reasons is likely they can't accept that high volume of input into, the, into their treatment plants. Um, it will just flush, flush all the material right out. Sorry? What type? Just a, 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 a wastewater treatment process. I'm not sure exactly what their flow sheet is in Hamilton. Um, I have a 
motion to actually get all the moments away from the treatment plant. But um, in Hamilton, I haven't looked up. There's not too much on the website that I can find. That they don't offer tours of the Hamilton away from the treatment plant process. <coughs> So what we, what we find is once we have that experimental curve, that curve gives you a lot of information. In fact, if you read these, these publications by, by these people here, Tommy, Fitch, Cohen, Clevenger, these are the four key people that have designed um, or showed equations how to design the area from those curves. Those papers were written in the 1920s. Uh, the theory hasn't really advanced too much or added on too much since then. But those two procedures are, they can be phenomenally compli complicated. Uh, there's a lot that you get from that second curve over there that is not readily apparent until you read some of those papers. Um, but really all that it is is just a clever form of mass balance as you move along the curve over time and you can then calculate a more accurate estimate of the area. So the areas I, calculations I presented are just rough guides, then these equations will modify them up or down depending on the features that are seen in that curve. And uh, this book by Swarovski is, is easily available um, online. The fourth edition is what the third edition looks like. It's called Solid Fluid Separations and it's literally just on all sorts of unit operations related to solid fluid separation. So about the first three, uh, oh, sorry, chapters five and six I think are related to the material we've been looking at in this course. So far, and then the other chapters on cyclones and, and filters and other solid fluid separation steps. So I put here in practice, we will rely on outside people to design these units more to get an exact number for us. As ChemEng people, we will want to get a rough estimate if we're doing capital cost estimation. But what we really are interested in is more on how these units, um, the, these equations we've learned so far are not totally irrelevant, we're going to use them to learn how we can modify the unit's operation. If we need to put a higher throughput through the system, what will be the, the net effect on the system? So with that in mind, let's take a look at what some of the rules of thumbs are regarding the design of these processes and what the important criteria are and what the important criteria are not. So what we're interested in is maybe what width and depth should this settler have and the residence time in the center. So those are the two key issues. The width and depth define the size of the unit, and then the residence time is then defined by the, the flow rate, the volumetric flow rate into the unit. So once the size is fixed, then the volumetric flow rate is the only parameter we have to influence the residence time. Now, these tanks can either be circular or rectangular in, in, in practice. So here I have a photo of uh, a sedimentation plant in Australia, there's, they're busy building it. Um, so there's the rectangular base being built and, the, and, the, and the, the concrete and metal supports for it, the slope sides. The circular basins are the standard ones that you've probably seen if you've driven past any wastewater treatment um, plant. It's just a, and then I've added that diagram over here for it um, that shows the circular basin with the, with the uh, walkway over the top of it. So those are, that's the step, those are the two standard designs. The main issue with any of these systems is that you don't want short circuiting. So you want your flow in to be very uniform across the, uh, across the, the, the width of the unit, if it's a rectangular system, or if it's circular, you want that flow to come in at the center and flow uniformly out towards the edges. There should be no possible way that the feed entry can quickly bypass to the exit. So with a rectangular unit, I'll show you in a minute an illustration uh, where the feed comes in on the one end of the rectangle and moves over to the exit on the other. So there's no possible short circuit. Um, the removal efficiency is purely related to how the, the material flows through that tank. So we want that incoming flow that has a, has a lot of kinetic energy, as we've learned in, in our second year fluid flow courses. The incoming flow has, has energy, and that energy needs to be dissipated. If it's not dissipated, it's going to disrupt the, the setting that's taking place already. Um, you want that flow to be evenly distributed in the tank, and you want um, the, 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 the flow from the overflow and the underflow to be pulled out without creating any hydraulic current. So even at the, 
at the bottom of the base, we've got our solids being removed. That design of that removal needs to, to be done so that we're not creating a hydraulic current so that fluid can channel from the entrance straight out to the bottom. Right, so it, it needs to be removed at a slow and steady rate to prevent that channeling or hydraulic currents from being formed. And then usually we remove the solids by some form of scraping or uh, a, a, a rake or a moving bed at the bottom. So sometimes they'll have, have like a conveyor belt at the bottom that's just slowly just going and, and rotating around and just move, pulling the solids to one end and then you'll have a set of pumps to then draw the solids off. So here let's take a look at, at what I call the ideal rectangular basin. So this doesn't exist in principle um, in, in terms of the fact that we don't have in, in reality these zones. But from a conceptual point of view, and if you wanted to even uh, build a mathematical model for it, this would be a good, a good uh, first start. So we have our inlet zone, which is assumed that all the material coming in at our inlet is uniformly distributed across the edge of that rectangle, which may or may not be true, depending on how that, how that inlet pipe is designed, is designed. But for the most part, we're assuming from top to bottom and from left to, uh, from the cross section of the tank, viewed from the top, that all our material is uniformly distributed. And then all that material is going to uniformly move across over to the exit side. So it will pass then through this settling zone over here. And the key point with the, with the rectangular tank is that we've got the terminal settling velocity of the particles down, so we have a vector in the, in the downward direction, but the fluid is moving in the horizontal direction. So the particles will settle and pump at this diagonal rate, and the angle of the line is, is a function of the particle's size in the second zone. And what we hope for is that that terminal settling velocity is faster than the horizontal fluid velocity so that the vector component there lets that particle land up in the sludge zone before the exit. So in reality, we've got particles coming in of multiple sizes. Up to now in the exercises, we've assumed particles of a single diameter, but we will never have that in, case, in, in practice. So we need to design for the worst case, which is our smallest particle, and we want to then for this design, track what our smallest particle's terminal setting velocity is and ensure that the residence time in the tank, in other words, the residence time is the time with which the fluid then moves horizontally. That velocity is not going to be so fast so that even the smallest particle won't have a chance to set up. We want those small particles to, to be able to reach the sludge zone before the end of the, the, end, before the end of the tank. So that's our key parameter. Once you have a fixed tank, which is where if any of you will work with one of these systems in the future, it's very unlikely you're going to be designing it from scratch. You're going to be landing up with an existing tank. So now your area is fixed and your volume of the tank is fixed. All the only parameter you have to play with is which which one of the parameters you could influence in a system like this. The flow rate coming in. Else? Yeah. So flow rate out, flow rate in, flow rate out. If we're assuming that we're going to be in steady state. Anything else? Agitation speed. Agitation speed. Well, this one there's no agitation at all. Uh, we're the angle. The angle of. How would you influence that angle? So that angle is, is, is based on the solids themselves. So the solids will set up at, at some velocity, and the horizontal component is due to the, the flow rate, which was, was mentioned already. Yes, you could influence the design and how that flow is dissipated. The other thing that you could, could influence is you could adjust your choice of flocculants up front so that you form larger particle sizes, and then they'll sink out more rapidly. So if you have an existing basin and you want to increase its handling capacity of solids, one option is to investigate the use of different flocculants, increase the particle size diameter, and thereby increase that velocity. Once you have a faster settling velocity, then you can ramp up your horizontal fluid velocity to increase the rate of solids removal. 
So this, the reason why we're looking at this conceptually is so that we can understand what are the parameters that influence and what, what can we change. We can change that incoming flow rate Q, and we can change one or more of the parameters in that theoretical equation that influences the thermal settling velocity. And once we can do those, then we can increase the, the usage of this, of this unit. The other thing that's interesting about these units is that adjusting the depth of them has no effect. Okay, this is a new slide that I, I didn't have in the notes. But I was, I, I was looking at this, um, I thought this is, this is really good to understand, is that when you're designing these units, for a given flow rate Q, so for a given entry flow rate, if I double the depth of my tank, I'm halving the velocity in the horizontal direction. So that vector we had in the horizontal direction here earlier on, the fluid velocity, once we've doubled the depth of the tank, that velocity gets halved from a pure mass boundary basis. And the interesting thing is that a particle of a fixed diameter would settle at exactly the same point in both tanks. So doubling the tank's depth is not going to make make your system remove any more particles or less particles. So that's an interesting factor, right? When we design these units, one of the biggest capital uh, functions that we're going to pay for is the depth of that unit. A deeper tank is going to cost more money. But this is a nice result that's showing that really, within theoretical bounds, doubling the tank depth is not going to get us anything better. So that's one of the reasons when you look at these wastewater treatment plants, next time, take a look at how large the diameters of those tanks are. That's the main issue. The depth of them is not too much of an issue. You really just want a long, a huge settling area. You're not too concerned about the depth of them. The other thing to bear in mind is when we're looking at circular settling tanks is we have a slightly different profile. Here we've got our inlet zone now at the center usually. So our, our flow coming in is then dissipated in that inlet zone. And those particles then move radially outwards to the edge of the tank because that's where we're drawing the fluid flow off on the outlet zone. So this is a circular tank. We've got outlets all around along the side. We've got our weir, which is then overflowing, pulling the liquid out to the edges. So our horizontal fluid velocity goes from the center of the tank out to the edge, but that is changing with the radius of the tank. So that flow rate is a function of the radial distance from the center. The flow of that horizontal fluid velocity decreases the further and further you, you get from the center of the tank. As a result, our terminal settling velocity, which is constant, that, that, that one doesn't change. So we've got a constant downward velocity, we've got a changing horizontal velocity as a function of the radius. As a result of that, we get this arced type shape. So that's a, this is a theoretical model to have in your mind. In practice, depending on, on fluid dynamics and flow in this unit, that's not going to be achieved. But that's, that's the general principle, is that at least towards the edge of the tank, we're going to have slower horizontal rate uh, velocities. So when we when we're looking at some, some other rules of thumb here, one is um, if you, you you can do a simple volume and mass balance over these units, it's a it's very reasonable to assume that they're operating at steady, steady state. So we know our inlet flow rate and we know our inlet mass flow rate. Those are the design parameters that we, we usually have in, in our hand. And then we can then specify either the surface over, overflow rate, so what is the meters cubed per day per meter squared. Um, that's leaving the tank, so that's the liquid flow rate leaving the tank. We can also specify the loading rate that we looked at yesterday. What's the kilograms per day per meter squared of solids leaving? So these are some, some guidelines for most uh, uh, wastewater treatment processes. That, that overflow rate is in the order of 40 meters cubed per day, though there are designing systems that are, are lower and lower, so they're getting to about 28 to 25 per day, depending on some of the newer designs. Um, secondary clarifying units are, are between 12 and 30. Those are typical specs. 
the, the minimum depth of these units is around three meters. So they usually won't go lower, uh, smaller than three meters, but you also won't go much, much bigger than that, given that rule there that the depth isn't too much of a factor. Um, we most often find these tanks have a minimum diameter of six meters, and then there's, a, there's usually a length-to-width ratio that's obeyed for rectangular tanks. So uh, just uh, that terminology on, on what's, a, what's the overflow rate, this is for a primary, primary unit, this is for a secondary unit. Uh, that refers just to the flow sheets. Um, so I have the treatment points, what is it now? I have the flow sheet here of the Burlington rate for treatment. Yeah. So this is the Burlington wastewater treatment plant. Um, so they have a screen for, for, for solids. So this is just unusual solids that come into the wastewater treatment system. And then they have the primary unit over here, which uh, removes most of the solids. And then those solids then get treated over here uh, using organic uh, processes and in the aeration basin. And then we've got bacteria here as well in, a, in, a, in another aeration basin in the final clarifier. So that's our secondary unit. And then that depth overflow is then put back into lake material. And that's, that's not 100% clear, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's mostly mostly clarified water that's safe to put back into the lake. And then solids are, are, are removed and they use as fertilizer. So that's a very basic flow sheet. There's, there's a lot more to it for those of you that study waste for treatment processes in, in civil engineering courses. And I think there's a bio course where you can guys do waste for treatment. So you, you know that you're comfortable with flow sheets in general, but for those of you who are not, the primary refers to upstream in the, in the flow sheets and the secondary terminology that refers to, to further down in the flow sheet. Um, just some other things here, and then we'll do, uh, we'll have some exercises. I also want to use Fridays for sort of like a little type of tutorial session, so um, in, a, in a few minutes I'll wrap up the section we'll go through one or two problems. But um, just to end up here with some, some rules of thumb, the solids should stay in, in, the, in the system, a good rule of thumb is for about two hours. Um, you don't want them in there longer than that. Um, except maybe in winter time it may take, may take a bit longer for them to settle out. Uh, so, but in general it's about two hours to half a day um, at the very most. Organic solids, we typically have our underflow coming out at about 5 to 10 percent solid. So there's a, there's a substantial amount of water coming out in the underflow stream. Inorganic solids, so if you're dealing with mining waste and so on, that's in the order of 20 to 30 percent. Uh, if you read Perry's, they make this very bland statement that do not have long residence, or avoid long residence times um, because compaction of solids is incomplete. Um, and I was just thinking when I was working in Coca-Cola at, at uh, we were starting up this, this sedimentation vessel. And for those of you who ever uh, will work in commissioning of a process, I highly recommend that if you ever get a chance to commission a process, you do it because that's where you will put the process in very unusual states of operation and learn the most about how the system works. But uh, here we were running the Coca-Cola plant and we were starting it up and uh, the motor stopped overnight and the next morning there was a solid layer of sludge at the bottom, which is the inconvenient solidification that Paris refers to. And um, fortunately, this was in Swaziland where uh, labor is very, very cheap, so you can rent a whole lot of people for a couple of days and with spades to dig this stuff out, but it's not a pleasant smell and it's not a pleasant task to do. So avoid long residence times of your solids to avoid this inconvenient compaction um, that will take place. So, so those are just some rules of thumb. And actually, conversely, that also means that you have to have very good monitoring on your motors and your pumps set to make sure that you're constantly withdrawing that. If, you're, if your motors or your pumps break down, you're going to be in a whole lot of trouble. Um, just some of the other designs. Sometimes these units are provided as a coherent steel tank. So if you're a steel tank all the way with square edges, but then you embed in this, this diagonal. Or you can just build it from scratch on a, on a concrete pad that's already sloped. Um, but this unit is, is purchased as a steel tank with a flat bottom that's been filled in a bit of the side. We've seen some of the other features, such as the rake um, over here. So that rake helps to just 
create channels through the solids for liquids to escape. We've got a feed well over here over which the material is dissipated. And then we always, we always, we always have walkways to the center to get to the pump. Um, maybe we might need to declog the feed well if something's gone wrong or for maintenance purposes. Um, Here's a, there's, a, there's a whole lot of interesting feed well designs. Like I said, many of them are proprietary and you can't, you can't really find drawings of them. But here's one, uh, one design where the feed is, comes in and is actually split in half and they are then forced against each other. So that one half of the feed comes in counterclockwise, the other half comes in clockwise and the, they cancel each other out to dissipate that energy of the incoming feed. And this is also a nice design because if you have some flocculants added here into the feed, this mixing over here will actually mix your flocculants up as well. Um, and then you've got these, the plants then, the liquid then overflows out the edge and starts to settle down out the bottom here. So you've got mixing taking place and your flocks forming and then your flocks and the liquid can then leave with no disruption out the middle here um, and then start to settle out. So that, that's a really neat design. Uh, and then here in the center you've got your, the drive shaft that's driving the mix through the circumference. But there's many other feed designs. This is just, just one of them. In terms of capital costs, um, most of your, the, the costing is done in terms of the diameter of the tank. So here's some, some old numbers from Swarovski. Uh, so the cost is a function of the, the diameter X, so X raised to the certain power 1.4, it's just an empirical number that's found over many such tanks. Um, so that will give you a rough estimate of the dollar figure, and unfortunately this paper doesn't say what dollar, what year the dollar figure is. So sometimes in the 70s or the 80s, and so when you get that cost, then you have to escalate it up from inflation to pay its dollars. But the main thing here is that that's just the equipment cost. Your installation cost is going to be at least three to four times that um, due to uh, site surveying, preparation, putting that rebar in, uh, backfill of the soil. Um, so, so those costs are going to be far more substantial than the tank itself. And then you have to take into account your equipment operation uh, costs, the rakes and motors, that walkway. Any, there's a whole lot of instrumentation on these units to monitor flow rates. PH, if it's a biological unit, there'll be BOD and other measurements taking place. Some of those are instruments and some are not. So, and then there's your operation costs that are um, fairly minor. So here's a, a very large tank, 60 meters in diameter, so uh, yeah, 60 meters diameter, 30 meters radius. That rake, just to give you an idea, it is uh, using uh, 1 million newton meters Talk, uh, that comes to a cost of 12 kilowatts. What is that? What would be the daily operating cost of that? And today's electricity cost. Is that bigger? What is electricity cost today? <coughs> These are numbers we must know as engineers. We have to know this. So, what is the energy cost for electricity? What do you pay in your house for electricity? Give or take. It's 10 cents a kilowatt hour. There's, there's the time, they now have the three times of the day, the low peak, mid peak, and high peak. But the average of that is in the order of 10 to 12 cents per kilowatt hour. A company may get a, a deal with the hydro of, of less than that. I'm not exactly sure what the companies would get, but I would assume a safe guess would be around 8 cents per kilowatt hour. And if they're using that in the evenings, they'd probably get as low as 4 or 5 cents per kilowatt hour, which is why a lot of, like, Energy intensive companies like Stealth and the Task are then run late at night. Yes? There's something that I read in the summer. Because of all the free energy push, yeah. there is now a tax on the companies to help pay for that. And in fact, they tend to be more than what you're actually paying for interest. Okay, so the companies are paying more now than they used to in the past. Yeah. So that number there, 12 kilowatt hours, that's if you calculate at 10 cents uh, a kilowatt hour, that would come up to about $300 per day. So that's a very minimal operating cost for a company. So this is a monster, monster tank, uh, a, a large rake, uh, very low operating costs. Your labor and, and that load is going to be a lot more than your electricity cost. Uh, that, that unit is, is rotating at 9 meters per minute. Um, your, 
if you've got any chemical requirement of flocculation, that's almost always going to be your, your primary operating cost for that system. Okay, so there's a few other designs regarding sedimentation that I'll let you look at. There's some interesting uh, videos and drawings on the web for what's on Mala, uh, where you put inclined plates into the sedimentation vessel. Uh, so take a look at that. Uh, there's also a unit called deep cone thickeners, uh, which is exactly what, what it is, what it sounds like. And then if you want uh, some more references on the design of these units, uh, those, those links up there, those DOI numbers, uh, if you click on them. Uh, by the way, DOI numbers, is so that something you're familiar with? No? So a DOI number is, if I've got a journal publication, a DOI number is a unique way to identify journal publication no matter which book it's published in um, or uh, which journal it's published in. The DOI number, if you click on it, will always take you to, to that publication. So it's a unique web address to get to a journal publication. And at McMaster, you have free access to those right now. Um, and then this book is in the library in the third or fourth edition. So, that's some, if you want to read a bit more, or maybe this is an area you want to do your course project in for this course, those would be good references to, to look at. So let's take a look at these questions then for the rest of the class. Um, I will let you do this in, in, with, your, with your neighbor, and then I'll take, take it up in about four or five minutes. So we have the need to calculate the, the area and diameter uh, for a circular signal. We've got a certain capacity of slurry we need to treat per hour. And the particle size there is assumed to be 20 micrometers. So the diameter is 20 micrometers, density 2,600 kilograms per meter per cylinder. We're in a water-based system, and the concentration of those particles is 650 kilograms per meter cubed water of material, of feet. Uh, we don't have the luxury to test the slurry in a laboratory using an over-design factor of 1.5 millisecond second velocity. Let's calculate that area and that diameter. Then you will calculate what the underflow volumetric flow rate is based on a simple uh, balance, and then you will calculate what the separation factor, which was that number that we introduced right back on Tuesday. So let's uh, work on that for about uh, for the next three, four, five minutes, and then I'll uh, look into the answers.
total segment crosses here. Right, because the, the cross-sectional area is given by um, the feet concentration times the inlet concentration, uh, feet flooring times the inlet concentration divided by the flux, or if we simplify that out, it's Q divided by V. So we've got Q, the incoming feet, so the volumetric flooring. We're just looking for that value <coughs> of the second velocity. The next question is, is, is uh, the next two questions are should be very straightforward. Let's take a look at. We're trying, we're aiming for a desired underflow of 1560 kilograms of solids per meter cubed. <coughs> so uh, if we look at that pictorially, we've got our sedimentation vessel, we've got our inlet flow rate Q, we've got our inlet flow rates, uh, our inlet concentration C0. We're going to create an underflow stream and an overflow stream. This assumption here in question two is saying that what if we get total separation of solids? In other words, all my solid material leaves at the bottom and this stream out of the top, my overflow, is only liquid. Or in this case, it's going to only be water. So making that, that crucial assumption, uh, which is for the most part quite reasonable, um, on, especially if it's a, it's a clarifier. The clarifier's intention is to get a very clear overflow. I think that we've got mines and solids in our overflow, but if this were a clarifier, our overflow is, is a, to, to a good approximation, is only water. All our solids coming in are leaving in at the bottom. And it's saying, if that desired uh, concentration is 1,560 kilograms of solids per meter cube. Here we're going to see 1,560 kilograms 
solve this equation. Omega cubed. What is going to be the flow rate of this stream? In other words, what is the pump size we need to design for down here for the volumetric flow rate of meters cubed per second? Okay, and I'll post another practice question onto the course website as well.